Welcome, uh, iGemmers, to um, this talk on engineering biological information processing systems. Um, in, in this talk, I'm uh, hoping to share with you folks a bunch of the things that I've learned over the years in working in this area. This is, uh, uh, my name's Jacob Beal. Um, I'm the uh, chair of the iGEM Measurement Committee um, and a scientist at BBN Technologies, where a lot of the work I've done for the past decade has been on biological information processing systems. So I wanna start with a question of, uh, what, what do I even mean by a biological information processing system? And here, I find it useful often to think about synthetic biology as being divided into three sort of general areas uh, overlapping in this Venn diagram here. On the one hand, you have uh, synthetic biology that's structural in focus, where we don't really care about the individual cells or chemicals, but we care about the large scale properties we can get out of their aggregates. So this is where things like, uh, say, the bacterial cellulose process, uh, <clears throat> project that the Imperial iGEM team did a few years ago goes. We we're really caring about this large scale material product or where work on uh, tissue engineering and organoids goes. Again, where we're really interested in a macro scale structure. On the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, there is chemical-focused synthetic biology, and this is where a lot of traditional metabolic engineering um, lives, things where you're really focused on the identity of specific chemical molecules, um, often producing or sensing them. And then the third sphere is an informational sphere where we don't really care about the identity of the chemicals, but instead our ability to <clears throat> interpret them as signals, uh, high, low, on, off, uh, near, far, et cetera. Uh, this is where a lot of the sort of very classic um, papers that kicked off the idea of synthetic biology come from, uh, like the band detector by Basu and Weiss up on the upper left. Uh, that's a bacterial colony in the center of those dots. Um, that is sending a signal that's causing thing, uh, other bacteria at different ranges to respond with different colors. Or um, on the right, that's a snapshot out of um, an oscillator system, uh, another of the sort of classic results of synthetic biology. <clears throat> so these information processing systems are often very exciting, um, and they overlap very strongly across lots of different applications. As the applications we're interested in get more and more complex, there's often more and more overlap between the world. So even though sort of pure biological circuits is necessarily only for uh, sort of, you know, fun programs like the band detector and the oscillators, as soon as you start thinking about applications in biosensors and therapies um, in all sorts of different areas in the chemical and structural world, getting a little bit of informational sensing and control starts to be very interesting and valuable. So in particular, in the informational world, I often tend to think about this in terms of biological circuits. And here, what we're really thinking about is the ways that we can sense, compute upon, and control cellular behavior. And I often think about sort of the simplest possible thing is over here on, on the left, uh, this example circuit. I think of this as the hello world of the biological information processing, where we're sensing a small molecule, in this case, arabinose. And if it's present, that should turn on the expression of GFP. And also turn on the expression of this TET R repressor that will turn off the expression of red. Uh, fluorescent protein. If there's no arabinose, then the green fluorescent protein won't get turned on, and also the repressor won't get turned on, which means that the red fluorescent protein uh, should appear. So this should be sort of a very simple switch uh, that in one condition uh, the cells fluoresce red, and in the other condition the cells fluoresce green. We're going to come back to this very, very simple information processing circuit a few times in here. 
lots and lots of potential applications of these types of circuits. Um, <clears throat> some examples being um, CAR T cell therapy. Um, this is a cancer therapy where we engineer these immune cells called T cells uh, to attack specifically cancerous uh, cells. And you have to have a little information processing circuit in there to make sure that your T cell is attacking only the cancer cells and not other cells. And for that, you'd really like to fuse together uh, with a small logic function a few different things it can detect. Another example, very, very different world. Um, lots and lots of <clears throat> bioproducts are essentially made with fermentation. And if we can put a control system rather than at the 10,000 liter or 100,000 liter tank level, but if we can actually put the control system into the cells so they can uh, <clears throat> change their behavior based on the micro conditions that they're uh, sensing right in their immediate environment, there are potentially a lot of ways that these processes can be improved. So in order to actually engineer this, I want to revisit one of the very sort of old um, diagrams of um, synthetic biology. This is from a, a early paper that Drew Endy put out, and a number of people have redrawn this and revisited this over the years, including myself. We you know, can think about down at the bottom level that you've just got some DNA. But actually, it's really hard to just engineer things in terms of TTGA, et cetera. So we think about parts. This is where a lot of iGEM lives is in uh, you know, terminators, coding sequences, um, aptamers, promoters, et cetera. What we'd really like to be able to do is dig it up to the top to think about systems where you know, I'm going to have a sensor that asks, you know, is this patient healthy or not? Or is this cell healthy or not for a CAR T system? Um, and if we find that um, it is not, then we're going to um, flip that signal. So uh, healthy, yes. Okay, then don't produce the drug. No, then yes, produce the drug. We want to think about connecting together modules like that. But in order to get between parts and modules, we need to have compositions of parts into devices like this arrangement here of um, a production cassette of a, a ribosome binding uh, site, a coding sequence for a protein, and a terminator. This little production set makes a protein that then represses a promoter. And together, that uh, collection can be thought about as a device that's an implementation of a Boolean knot function, a logical knot that we'd need in that system above. This is a simple example of an information processing device. And the big question I want to talk about through the whole rest of this talk is how do we make a device like this work? How do we understand it well enough that we can use it reliably in systems? which is where we really want to be working as genetic engineers. So let me drill down a bit more in the idea of um, a device here. And in particular, what we'd really like is to be able to use our device more than once. We don't want to uh, be engineering it just in context because uh, the real value of being able to engineer with the device is being able to predict what's going to happen uh, when I use that again. I don't want to have to evaluate the efficacy of my cancer therapy in patients who might die if it's not working quite right. I don't want to have to evaluate the efficacy of the control circuit in my 100,000 liter tank in 100,000 liter tanks that are extremely expensive. So we need to make sure that these things are predictable and reusable so that when I say, oh yeah, well, I'm gonna put a control circuit there to do that, that I have some reason to expect that that control circuit will work the way I expect it to, just the way that control circuits do um, in 
the electromechanical world and in the electronic world and in the hydraulic world and in every other world besides biology right now. So when I think about um, a module, a module is a reusable device which takes in some set of signals and puts out some other set of signals. So like our not device before took in a signal that it would interpret as being true or false. The signal is actually the activity of a promoter, but at the higher at the informational level, we can think about those levels of activity as being signals that mean true or false. And it put out another signal that was a true or false, which was opposite of the one that came in. So if true came in, then false came out. We can then connect that to different sorts of reporters, another module Y or a module Z. And we can only think about device X as being a module if when we connect it up in these different conditions, we don't change anything about the design of device X, even though its behavior might be a bit different because of its content context. The other thing is that we can only connect up to uh, modules if uh, their signal types and their signal levels match. So if I have a, uh, a module like our NOT, whose output signal is interpreted as a true or false um, in terms of the level of activity of a promoter, then if I connect it to another module, that one also has to be thinking about the activity of a promoter that's high or low to interpret as true or false as its input. So let's see an example of this. Let's take an, uh, another example. Here we're going to have a cell state sensor that's uh, sensing uh, some native state of the cell, say uh, you know an amount of stress or uh, you know a metabolic state. And we're gonna put that into an amplifier that's going to make that signal stronger and then report that with fluorescence. So here at this abstract level, we should already be able to see what this information processing system is supposed to do. Now we'll take examples of some of the modules that could be created for devices to actually do that. You know, here, a cell state sensor might be a particular promoter that responds to um, you know, the native transcription, transcription factors regulated by cell state, say sigma factors, um, and its output will be the transcriptional activity at whatever we stitch in here in this product. The amplifier, uh, let's say in this case, we're going to use um, an, um, <clears throat> an invertase uh, that's uh, going to, or sorry, a recombinase that's going to effectively clip out this uh, terminator, thereby turning on production of this product. Whether this gets turned on or not is regulated by promoter to be named. And what goes out is regulated by this product. And in both cases, the signal that's going here is the amount of transcriptional activity. And finally, we'll have our fluorescent reporter be GFP regulated by promoter to be named with a signal level being transcriptional activity. The important thing I want you to notice here is that at these boundaries between these modules, it's transcriptional activity and we're going to be able to click them together, filling in the blanks by overlaying these modules in order to make um, a system of three devices implementing this high-level system. So this is another very simple example of a biological uh, information processing system. Now, it turns out, if you do the right types of measurements, you can predict the behavior of these types of simple modular circuits. Uh, here's an example, some, some, some work I was involved in a few years ago, where we predicted um, two repressor cascades and feed forward networks uh, by taking measurements of single modules 
and using that to predict the behavior of connected modules. And the really important thing I want you to see on here is that on this range of um, you know, several hundred fold uh, difference between high and low values, the error in our predictions was less than twofold. So this is an example of how it's possible if you make the right types of measurements to predict the behavior of information processing systems and be able to access that high level, predictable, reliable engineering modular world. We've done this a few other times in other systems as well. So this is quite doable. In order to do it though, we need to be able to think about our modules and be able to answer a few questions. First of all, we need to be able to measure effectively what's my system doing at all? There's a reason I've ended up on the measurement committee and that this talk is a measurement talk. We need to be able to look at, my, at your devices and ask, okay, if I wanna make a circuit to do this, how good do my devices need to be? What's gonna be a working circuit? And then we need to be able to get appropriate devices and connect them together in ways that they're not going to get all unpredictable because of changes in their context as well. Figure out how do you actually build a good circuit. I want to address each of these in turn, starting with the first question of just how do you even measure effectively what it is that the devices and that your system are doing as you build it. And here I want to revisit one of my favorite papers and say terrible things about it. Uh, this is one of the uh, seminal papers of synthetic biology, a toggle switch that has these two uh, promoters controlling repressors, and, uh, inducers switching back and forth between them. And if we look at some of the figures from this paper, this is again, this is a wonderful paper, but there are some issues. Like on the fluorescence charts here, are, what, what are the units? There are no units. When I was in third grade in elementary school, I was told that when I had science, I always had to say whether it was meters or uh, kilograms or uh, liters or what, I, how many, what, what fluorescences are these? And there's another strange thing here. Over here we see, here's the memory of the toggle switch being shown, this beautiful separation between state 3A and state 3B that gets all uh, separated. This is high over here, low over there, there's a great big gap in between, and over here, when we look at the measurements from the individual cells taken on a flow cytometer, they're not that separated. In fact, we can see this high 3A state and the low 3B state are actually overlapping. What's going on here? Well, in this first bit, th these units, I can tell you this is just arbitrary units, which means whatever this analog to digital converter device inside of the flow cytometer that they were using to measure happened to return today under these instrument settings in this phase of the moon. Not repeatable, hard to interpret biologically is a challenge. And over here, what's going on is that they're reporting, these statistics aren't incorrect. It's not an error in the paper, but they're just not really telling you what's going on here. This is telling you the difference, the, the variation across replicates of where these peaks are, not how much the cells are actually different from each other. So if we really want to understand what our cells are doing, uh, to make an information processing system or any other system, we need to uh, be able to deal with these problems. Uh, fortunately, we can't. This is 20 years ago. 20 years has gone on, and you can do a lot better uh, than these folks did in your projects. For measuring fluorescence, we've got two really good um, options that have been partially developed. 
uh, through iGEM interlaboratory studies over the past few years. If you, your team is fortunate enough to have access to a flow cytometer, that's uh, what I consider really kind of a gold standard of measurement because you can get individual cell measures um, from every individual cell in your colony and see how much they ch differ from one another. And there are these lovely uh, rainbow beads that the US National Institute of Standards and Technology has certified that will tell you um, just how many molecules of a standard fluorescent molecule your fluorescence is equivalent to. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that you need to do in order to effectively get from the raw measurements of the flow cytometer to um, a good estimate of how many molecules your uh, device is, or system is producing. Um, but there are free and open packages made by us and others linked off of the measurement committee page that can do this for you. And the measurements you get out of, are highly replicable uh, to about 1.2 fold standard deviation. So you can get very, very precise measurements out of a flow cytometer. You can also get some great measurements out of plate readers. Uh, the 2018 iGEM uh, interlaboratory study was the final step uh, in a series of uh, plate reader calibration uh, that worked with both fluorescence and cell count via um, optical density, also known as OD measurements. So um, the you basically have a serial dilution going from very intense to very um, not intense of your fluorescence. And you do a similar thing with these little uh, beads that are approximately the same size and optical properties um, as E. coli. And this is a simple, cheap, highly stable, doesn't need a refrigeration um, set of reagents. and it lets you get per cell fluorescence measurements that are directly comparable with flow cytometry, highly replicable as established by uh, hundreds of iGEM teams using this. So if you've got a plate reader and almost every team um, has access to a plate reader, um, you can definitely calibrate your fluorescence measurements and you can calibrate your cell count measurements and this gives you great stuff to build on. So, okay, so you can measure your fluorescence. Ah, how should you understand your statistics? Here's where one of the things that is really important is that um, when we look at our distributions, they often are what's called heavy tailed, meaning that there's um, a small number that are extremely high. So, if you plot it on a uh, typical you know, uh, linear scaled axis, it looks very distorted and asymmetric. But if you plot it on a logarithmic axis, like here, these are some examples from the Voigt Lab's uh, cello uh, paper on uh, predicting and characterizing uh, circuits. Um, this, you find almost always, they're nice and symmetric when you plot on a log scale. And this turns out to be because uh, when you have gene expression in a cell, it's an, you can think about that as an exceedingly complex reaction, chemical reaction, whose rate can be estimated by uh, multiplying together the rates associated with all the different things in there. You know, how much of each of the subunits of the transcriptase, how much of each of the subunits of the ribosome, how much of each nucleotide, lots and lots of things that all vary a little bit based on cell state and happiness and so on. And their, their concentrations all together um, uh, multiply in the rate equation that controls how much gene expression is happening. When you add a whole bunch of variables, it gives you a nice, bell curve normal distribution. And for the same reason, when you multiply a bunch of variables, that gives you a log normal distribution, which means that 
you should always use geometric statistics. That is, first take a logarithm of your data and then compute your means and standard deviations in order to analyze um, what's going on with uh, your gene expression data. This applies both to single cell data, like it comes from a flow cytometer, and also to um, whole colony data, like what comes from a plate reader. Uh, here's an example of um, a histogram of some data. The blue line is the actual um, fluorescence coming out of this uh, <clears throat> particular sample of cells. And you can see that if we do a typical um, mean standard deviation on um, an <clears throat> on a non-logarithmic scale, we get this red estimate of uh, summarizing it, which is dominated by the few very high values and is just not, not reasonable. Doing a geometric estimate looks better and a bimodal uh, looks better yet. Another important thing to think about is if you're doing something where um, the collective output, like say the amount of chemical you're regulating, may be uh, important, that those very small fraction of very super performing cells may dominate the value you get. So, okay, so we'll use the right statistics on measurements that are coming out of, that are, that, are being calibrated to sell us something about the actual number of molecules and actual uh, number of cells. Now, can we get these reproducibly? There's often a lot of sort of mythology in bio about oh, reproduc reproducibility is hard, um, it's, it's super difficult to do the same experiment twice, and there's a lot of ways that can go wrong. But what we've found over the years in iGEM is that the problem isn't that the cells and the biology are hard. The problem is that the things we're trying to do to them are really complicated, and it's really easy to make a little mistake in there somewhere. Um, a few years ago, one of our other intralaboratory studies uh, was able to figure out that by adding a little bit of process controls, I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute, we could get a much better idea of whether an experiment produced good data or not. And that turned out to be really valuable for making things reproducibility. Now, you have to actually be measuring things with good units uh, and the right statistics, again, to even be able to do this. But if you've got those, now I want to make sure that you understand the idea of process controls as separate from experimental controls. Because we don't talk about process controls very much. But they're a very important thing of making things work right, especially with something as complicated as biological experiments. Usually when we talk about controls uh, in experiments, we're talking about the experimental controls that let you ask the question, is my hypothesis true? Process controls are a different set of controls that you should also run, which asks a question about should I trust this data or not? With experimental controls, you want one control for each factor that's affecting the hypothesis. You want to be getting new data, and the control should be almost identical to your experimental conditions because that very, very small difference is the thing that you want to check. Process controls, on the other hand, uh, you want one control for every assumption that you don't want to be testing. So if the experimental controls, there's one for each thing you do want to test. For the process controls, it's one thing for each thing you don't want to have to worry about in analyzing your experiment. You don't want to have to have a hypothesis that, oh, my flow cytometer wasn't working. Oh, uh, my plate reader was wrong. You want your hypotheses to all be about the biology. To help with validating those assumptions, you want your process controls to be with things who have known expected values that should never change and as little relationship as possible to the experimental conditions. 
So an example of that, again, let's come back to our you know, it, the example device being used to here, we'll, we'll say we're characterizing this. We've got a hypothesis that this device is gonna be able to turn on strong expression of GFP. An experimental control of this is the very simple thing of, okay, if I don't put in the recombinase, then I shouldn't get strong GFP. So as close as possible. Process controls are going to give us different things, like say, if we add in a red fluorescent protein as well to check and make sure which cells really have the system. Let's have a constituent of control in there so we can tell the difference between appropriately transformed cells and ones that just didn't get the, the system in the first place. We need positive controls of just our fluorescence to make sure our ability to detect and measure fluorescence is right and that we're getting the strength of fluorescence we thought we did. We need um, a transfection with no interesting system in it to make sure that what we're measuring isn't just a result of having abused the poor cells by transforming them. Uh, we want wild type cells. Uh, we want uh, beads for calibration so that we know how the fluorescence we measure relates to molecules of standard uh, fluorescent molecules. Uh, we want some just plain background material uh, so that we can make sure that our media um, or our measurement uh, <coughs> uh, fluid isn't messing with us. All these things are about making sure that the measurement is telling us what we think it's telling us. So, we've got the first major chunk, and this is the biggest piece because this is what, what gives us the ability to actually even ask the right questions in information processing. You have calibrated units, geometric statistics, good process controls that let us have reproducible measurements. I wanna to turn to the next piece now. How good do the devices I'm building need to be? And for this, I, I, I wanna ask a very uncomfortable question. A lot of times we say, all oh, this circuit works. Uh, here's a nice example. Here's again, coming back to our very simple, if there's arabinose, it's green. If there's no arabinose, it's red um, circuit. And here's some real data from a real implementation of it. Here's in the off condition, um, we can see that uh, the green is pretty low and the red is sort of the you know, middling. And in the on condition, the red is pretty low and the green is quite high. Um, and is this circuit working? Is that good enough? There's some overlap here um, that the red high is different than the green high. A lot of times we're very sloppy with this idea of what is high, what is low, what is working, what is not working. And it turns out there's some good answers that we can try to use for this, however, from the world of uh, signal processing. There's an idea of signal to noise ratio, which is specifically a question of how well can we distinguish two signals? So. In this case, for example, we can interpret uh, the distribution of cells in on as one signal, and the noise being how much variation there is from cell to cell. And the difference, uh, and the distribution of cells in the off condition being the other signal, with the noise being the variation from cell to cell. And if we apply uh, this standard signal to noise equation, we can get an answer of this in decibels. That's the same decibels that you can see on your sound system, your car speakers, um, that, that tells you the more decibels, the louder it is, the easier you can hear the music. Think of it the same way. The more decibels there are, um, the easier it is to tell if a cell you're looking at is in the on state or the off state. Here, there's a little bit of overlap but most of the cells, it can be pretty clear. Uh, stuff down here is off, stuff up here is on. It's only in the middle that it's kind of mushy. So this has sort of a moderate level. It's a bit over six decibels. Uh, how many decibels do we need? One of the things I think is really valuable about this question is it lets us relate the question of, is this working 
to the idea of is this working well enough for what I want to do with it? So if I'm going to do a fermentation controller where all I need to do is nudge the cells a little bit when they're in one state versus another state, I can probably get with a very low amount of decibels because I just need to nudge the, the cells around a little bit. Maybe, maybe even like negative two decibels would be okay. But on the other hand, if I'm doing a cancer therapy where my engineered cells are going to kill things in the bottle, body, if they make a mistake and think that, say, some of my lung tissue is cancer tissue and that's going to kill me, I want a really high decibel, maybe like 30 decibels, uh, where it's super, super difficult to confuse any cell. And this lets us then also start asking a question about when I look at an individual device that I want to work with, how good is that device for making applications that need a certain signal to noise ratio and a really good measurement for how effective a computing device do i have here is this measurement of delta snr that is the change in snr from the input to the output so i look at how clean the signal is on the output and if it's cleaner, easier to distinguish than the signal on the input, then I have a positive delta SNR. If it's blurrier than the signal on the input, that's a negative delta SNR. And that delta SNR tells us about the type of circuits we can make. So if we have a positive delta SNR, better than oh, around two decibels is a, a good heuristic threshold, then we can potentially make deep circuits that have a whole bunch of, of links in them. Because at every step, the signals clean themselves up a bit. This is the world that computers in. It's a very hard one for us to get to in bio right now. Right now in bio, a lot of our best things are right around zero decibels, which means that you can make shallow circuits. The, um, you can do a couple of links. But if you go more than two or three, it often um, starts getting blurry. And if your delta SNR is less than about negative two decibels, it's going to be very hard to work with that computing device because it's going to be just trying to turn everything into mush and to get it to work right, you're going to have to do super lots of tuning. So when you're thinking about working on an information processing system, you want to be able to measure to ask, how does my input compare with my output? Fluorescent proteins are great for that. And ask, is my, delta, is my basic SNR high enough? And is the amount I'm losing through delta SNR at each step? Okay, so if I have an SNR of 10 and I lose two at each step, I can still get a decent signal out after two stages of computation. If I start with a delta SNR of negative 10 decibels and I don't gain a lot at every step, I'm gonna have a hard time making my information processing system work at all. So this gives us answers that we can need for how good do my devices need to be. But what do we already have to build on that can help you get going in your project? You don't want to have to engineer everything from scratch. There are, in fact, some good devices out there that you can work with. Uh, one nice collection. Um, is the collection of TETR homologs that the Voigt Lab has developed um, that are available with their uh, cello system. Uh, these are for E. coli. And uh, four of these devices, their best four, um, have um, a delta SNR that is above zero so that they can be great to work with. And there's a bunch of others that are, um, you know, still not too bad on the negative. And some of them match their inputs and outputs relatively well. So you can build some real circuits with this stuff. There are some other good device families out there. Uh, there's a number of uh, integrase or recombinase logics. Uh, one came out of the Endy Lab a few years ago. There's others that 
uh, Tim Liu, Wilson Wong, others have made. Uh, these often have extremely good amplification, but some of them just don't switch. Um, and sometimes there's leak challenges. Uh, but, uh, but when you can get them flipping, you get very, very powerful um, values out. There are some other families of repressors uh, with this uh, tail um, <coughs> combinatorial targeting system. And there are CRISPR-based uh, as well. These are both great because you can get lots of them, um, though their signal-to-noise uh, uh, properties aren't quite as good for the tails. They're, they don't amplify well. So their, delta S, their, their base SNR is pretty good, but their delta SNR not so much. And we don't actually have very good numbers for the CRISPR ones. But these are all circuit things that people have built significant circuits with and have proven to be fairly uh, reusable in lots of circumstances. One last thing I want to bring up, though, is that what happens when you put your devices together in a circuit also matters a lot. I uh, was part of a project where we had a very painful experience with this a few years ago, uh, where uh, here's again our favorite circuit, um, Arabinos uh, inducing GFP um, and TEDR to repress RFP. So it's red with no Arabinos and green with Arabinos. And uh, we were having a hard time getting this really simple circuit to work because when we just changed the order of the transcriptional units, the behavior changed radically. Here's all 24 different combinations of these transcriptional units. And you can see that the behavior is just totally not the same across this. It turned out that the genetic context of what's upstream of your promoter can matter a lot in bacteria. We had to develop some insulators for uh, fixing this. And there's a simple method that you can do that. And in fact, there's a number of places where people have made simple methods to insulate your devices from effects of their context. So um, there are these insulators that you can put upstream of promoters that we've developed a method for, dealing with the relationship between the promoter um, and the uh, ribosome binding site and coding sequence. There's a couple of approaches there, including the RiboJ system out of the Voigt lab and the BCD system out of the ND lab. Or you can use the uh, ribosome binding site calculator that uh, Howard Salas has developed that can help you predict what's going to happen uh, when you uh, hook up a particular ribosome binding site with a particular coding sequence. It also can help. Um, you know, depending on the system, if you have the opportunity, if, you, if you're integrating, if you know where you're integrating and you can uh, characterize behaviors in those target sites, that can help. And if you have the ability to put things on multiple plasmids, which some systems do, uh, that can help separating out so you don't have your transcriptional units interacting when you put them next to each other. And uh, although most of your projects are likely to be in bacteria, as you move into eukaryotic cells, the mechanisms are different, and a lot of this gets a bit simpler. Bacteria are very, very tightly coupled, and if you happen to be able to work in plants and mammalian cells, they have their own challenges, but the context of um, a promoter and a coding sequence tends to matter a lot less. So there's the end of this whirlwind tour. Um, pieces for how to build a good circuit. There are some good devices out there and some good methods for reducing the interaction with context. And hopefully this can give you some good foundations in the ability to measure effectively so you've got good metrology, make appropriate models of devices that have nice strong signals that can let you answer the questions of what can I do, what parts do I need, why is this not working? to let you make all the pieces you need to do the awesome applications that are what motivates many of us to get into this space in the first place. And with that, uh, let me stop sharing and um, 
try to come over for seeing if we have time for a question or two um, at the end of this. So I, I can now see your um, the questions that go up in the chat. Um, I'm also going to point out any uh, questions that you have. Um, we are happy on the measurement committee uh, to dig in in detail. There's a measurement survey um, that uh, we are, uh, are uh, asking people to um, tell us other needs that you might have. And we'll be very happy uh, to help with your projects in any way that's useful uh, in the office hours we're going to be helping, we're going to be holding later this summer. And uh, let's see, I see a uh, question uh, asked, uh, can you use a traditional control type logic control these biological devices like a PID controller or a PI controller? Um, this is something that uh, some research groups have uh, done some work on. Uh, Domitil Del Vecchio at um, MIT and Richard Murray at Caltech are two of the ones I happen to be familiar with. Um, and they have essentially tried to build these controllers inside of the cells themselves. Um, essentially, the key idea being that you want to use a fast process uh, like uh, you know, ribosomal um, regulation to control a slow process like gene transcription. So, or sorry, RNA level regulation is a fast process and a full protein transcription is a slow process. Um, so it does seem possible. You can also uh, put controllers outside of your cells if you have a good reporter from your cell to be a signal. That's one of the lovely things about fluorescence reporting is that can let you couple to an electronic system where building the controller is a lot easier, but you need to have a really good idea of um, how to get a strong fluorescence and what that fluorescence is telling you about your circuit. So hopefully that's useful. Uh, any other quick questions before we sign off? All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, I hope that this has been useful. Um, and uh, <clears throat> please visit the measurement hub for more uh, information on the protocols and software tools that I talked about today to help you with uh, calibration and measurement to get things uh, built up um, and for assistance on modeling as well. Thank you and signing off. <laughs>